All walks of life have been massively impacted by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and the film and television industries are no different. Productions around the world were halted as lockdowns took effect, and planned film releases have been postponed. As of the time of writing, some film crews are starting to return to work, but their working conditions are massively different. As a result of these precautions, the content they are working to produce will also be massively changed. These are the two major areas which the current crisis will change, the content creatives are making, and the conditions in which that content is produced. One has a direct effect on the other, and so this video will aim to shed some light on some of the changes that will be made. Of course, different countries around the world are presenting different proposals for new production guidelines, but for the purposes of this video, I will mostly be referring to UK film industry practices as they relate to the production of American Hollywood films. Let's start with the working conditions as there is perhaps more tangible evidence related to it. Last week, the British Film Commission released their official guidelines for film and high-end television production to return to work. These guidelines have been sanctioned by the UK government, who have, at the time of writing, given film productions the green light to resume work. The guidelines include the employment of a dedicated COVID-19 supervisor to every production, additional health and safety training for all crew members, daily symptom checks, the encouragement of regular hand washing, and daily deep cleans of studios, locations, offices, and equipment as required. It is therefore recommended that in order for productions to operate in accordance with these guidelines, that they allocate more time. Shooting days will therefore be shorter to accommodate deep cleans, and as more time will be required to stage and block scenes safely, more shooting days will also be required. For an industry which has traditionally utilised lengthy shoot days, with 11 hour workdays as standard and even more for some departments and allowing for overtime, this is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, some industry unions have been lobbying for reduced shoot days for a long time. However, this will mean that productions will become more expensive, having to hire crew and equipment for longer periods of time. For large-scale blockbuster productions, this is unlikely to be an issue, and the end products will be virtually identical to what they would have been without the pandemic, even if their release dates are a little later than anticipated. But for smaller productions, like independent films and some TV drama, money which may have been spent on larger set pieces or extensive visual effects may have to be compromised, and so we could see fewer mid-budget films over the next few years. The idea of mid-budget films has been on the decline anyway, with studios prioritising big tentpole event films, so this pandemic may unfortunately see the final nail in the coffin. It does, however, mean that the money studios would have spent on such films may be reallocated to various low-budget projects, which, as a result of this new gap in the market, may reach a wider audience than they otherwise would. This domino effect is purely speculatory, but if true, could enable a new generation of filmmakers to get their work seen by a larger audience. That said, some have suggested that rather than budget from mid-scale productions going to smaller films, it may simply go back into the safe, large-budget blockbusters, which are virtually guaranteed to make studios profit. To that end, franchises like Marvel and Star Wars are likely to be safe, but it is entirely possible that studios would be unwilling to take risks on new properties in the current economic climate. It is incredibly difficult to predict, and unfortunately there won't be a clear answer as to which way the studios swing for some time. The guidelines also include recommendations regarding large crowd scenes, suggesting that, where possible, production should avoid hiring large numbers of supporting artists and instead use visual effects to generate extras. Again, for large productions this is unlikely to be an issue, and for low-budget films, they likely wouldn't have had the budget to hire large crowds anywhere. But for the mid-budget productions, VFX replacement crowds may not be possible, particularly if they did not have an extensive VFX budget to begin with. And again, this will make the end result on screen vastly different from the original vision. Of this, some industry creatives have suggested that new films and programmes are likely to be commissioned if they prioritise one fixed location and a small cast of actors. Films like these have performed successfully in the past, and so may become a staple of new content in the coming years. Screenwriter Ewan Morrison suggests that there may be an influx in dramas set in deep space, under the sea, or in surreal closed environments like remote islands. Something else to consider is the use of LED screen technology used prominently in the new Disney Plus series The Mandalorian. With the recent announcement of Unreal Engine 5, this technology could begin to be used more widely, particularly for productions where travelling to a certain remote or fantastical locations is simply not feasible. Some of the charm of shooting at actual locations would be lost, but the shooting environment would be much more controlled and potentially less at risk. Currently, however, the infrastructure to use this technology is not in place, and is certainly less viable for low-budget productions. 
it's also noteworthy that productions that do shoot on location have a knock-on effect in that they support local economies. While shooting, the crew make use of local amenities, and when a production proves popular with audiences, it then also becomes a tourist destination and can boost the local economy for years to come. If productions choose to shoot only in studios, this economic benefit will be lost. Additionally, shooting in studios is not entirely without risk. Although these environments can be more controlled and are purpose-built for film production, they are not ideal places to maintain social distancing. Large crews can be huddled together in close proximity in even the largest studios as the sets take up most of the space, and in some cases they can be poorly ventilated. As a result, studios get hot very quickly, especially with the number of people inside. Furthermore, the amount of equipment inside is required to change hands regularly. Even with frequent intervals for deep cleans, these places are optimal for transmission of COVID-19. In late April, the BBC's Head of Drama Commissioning suggested that one way to combat this would be to quarantine cast and crew together before shooting, but frankly this is not viable. The measures suggested in the British Film Commission's guidelines are sensible, but potentially not adequate. As industry professionals have suggested, the film industry relies heavily on social proximity and physical contact on a regular basis in order to get anything done. Some key creatives have suggested that production is not possible until the pandemic crisis is over or a vaccine is discovered. And this is another issue which the film industry will have to face. Despite pause productions like The Batman and Mission Impossible 7 being given the green light to continue, few films are looking to resume until July at the absolute earliest. If indeed there is a second wave of the virus as a result of the lockdown measures being eased, or if one crew member is positively tested for coronavirus halfway through shooting, productions will once again have to cease, and this is not financially viable for the studios especially seeing as insurance providers will not cover COVID-19 related ceases on any new policies taken by productions. Without this safety net, studios are reluctant to begin production again. Film studios are therefore looking to the UK government to help cover these costs. A spokesman from the UK government's Department of Sport, Media and Culture said, we are working closely with the screen sector to understand the full extent of concerns about insurance and explore ways they can be effectively addressed. However, as of the time of writing, no agreement has been made between the government and the screen sectors regarding insurance costs. Until this is agreed, it's doubtful that productions will resume. It's probably likely that the government will offer support, especially as the UK film industry has become a vital part of the country's economy. Last year, over £3 billion was spent on film production in the UK, 51% more than the previous year. The industry has also seen a 16% growth in GVA over the last few years, far more than the UK's wider growth of just 4%. With many more big Hollywood productions looking to shoot in the UK over the next few years, these numbers are only likely to grow further, so the idea of getting the industry back to work is in the country's favour. Yet, without proper arrangements in place for ensuring productions against COVID-related ceases, and guidelines which may not go far enough in preventing the spread of disease on shoots, studios agree that it is too soon to resume. Although this video is mostly concerned with how the production industry will be affected, it's noteworthy that the exhibition industry too will be impacted by the pandemic. Cinemas have already closed, and releases have been pushed back to later in the year until such a time as they can reopen, although some films have found great success in being released early on video on-demand services. Some films have even skipped theatrical releases entirely, and have instead debuted on various streaming services. Admittedly, such films were projected to perform poorly at the box office, and those predicted to do well, such as No Time to Die, are still planned to have a traditional cinematic release. With on-demand streaming services proving as popular as ever in lockdown, it's entirely possible that we could see more major releases online in the future, especially as cinemas are currently unsure as to how popular they will be when they reopen. Indeed, some cinema goers are likely to skip new films out of fear of the virus and will instead wait for them to become available online. Until they do reopen, this is unclear, but no matter the outcome, the physical exhibitors too will face financial difficulties and may also have to rely on government support over the coming years. Clearly, when the film production industry does return to work, it will be a wholly different industry. Unfortunately, as has already been the case during this period of furlough, some crew members will be laid off and crew sizes on new productions will invariably be smaller. As discussed, large blockbusters will have the budget to deal with logistical issues and so the final output will be very similar to what it would have been otherwise. However, smaller scale projects will probably have to sacrifice some sense of scale and new commissions will prioritise minimal locations and cast. 
Thank you for watching. As discussed at the start, different countries are dealing with the crisis in different ways, and so although the film industry across the world has been affected, the guidelines offered will differ between nations. It's difficult to say how effective the UK guidance will be until productions resume properly next month, but this video has offered some hypothetical outcomes. If you'd like to do some more reading into this topic, all of my sources are listed in the description as usual. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe for more, but until next time, thanks.